Well, good afternoon again. We're here to hear a man who I've known casually over the years. Met him here at the festival. And uh, like many of us, he's come back many years. And uh, now he's going to share something important with us. As he told us yesterday in the panel, he currently calls home Milton, Massachusetts, which is, do we call that a Boston suburb? And then he's been spending a lot of time at uh, Boulder, Colorado, wearing several different hats. And of course, that's where the Glenn Miller Archive is. And he has worked with Alan Cass, the Director Emeritus of, of the uh, Archive. He, uh, our guest, spoke for many years with Steve Miller, the son of Glenn Miller, about the subject of this book. And he told me yesterday he still talks with Steve, although Steve passed away several years ago. He feels like he's been looking over his shoulder. So the man I'm talking about is the spray. And with no further introduction, here he is to present his book, Glenn Miller Declassified. Thank you very much. Um, can I get there? I want to, um, before starting, repeat something I said yesterday for people who may not be here. Alan and Sue Cass want to send you their love and best wishes. They were not able to attend this year for the first time in Alan's case in history because their daughter-in-law was graduating and with her PhD and that took precedence over this. Sure. So this afternoon we're going to take a trip back to the year of 1944. Our journey will start a little bit before 1944 and 1942. And our subject is Major Glenn Miller. And this has been, this presentation you will see today is a, only a thumbnail glance at a book I have just finished called Glenn Miller Declassified, which is being published, well, it's, it's been published in the sense that it's been printed. It will be released September 1st. It is under the aegis of the Potomac Books label. Potomac Books is an old Washington, D.C. publishing house that specializes in military and political history, and it is owned by the University of Nebraska Press, which I have to say is kind of odd for a person with an Iowa background as a graduate of Iowa State University and being connected with, and being connected with the University of Colorado Boulder. My worldview was that the University of Nebraska Lincoln was not necessarily a friend but I've had to reevaluate that now. <laughs> so, um, now to serious business. For 70 years plus, for good and for well intentioned from well intentioned people, and in some cases not so well intentioned people, the story of what happened to Major Glenn Miller has been distorted. And his military service has not necessarily been appreciated for what it really was in the way that he might, I think, want to have been remembered. But what we want to attempt to do with this, with this presentation is um, give you the highlights of what has been accomplished over a long period of time in researching, examining, and evaluating information from multiple sources about what happened. And I hope that at the end of the day, when you leave today, you'll have a little bit more appreciation for a wonderful, wonderful human being. And um, the more I've discovered about him, the greater my respect for him has, has grown. Not that it wasn't already there in the first place. So the other thing I would say, many, many details, perhaps 99% of what has gone into this new book we will not have the opportunity to talk about today because of obvious constraints, and we'd like to get you to see the Glenn Miller Orchestra in an expeditious fashion. So off we go, and I'm gonna to try to go through this, and because of the constraints, I apologize in advance for the screen, 
I'm going to try to read slides as we go through them so that if there's any fuzziness or they're hard to read, I will read them for you as we go. So bear with me if I'm sounding like I'm lecturing, I don't mean to. So let's get started. We're going to talk about three things today. The rationalization for the Glenn Miller Declassified Project, why it's been accomplished, what the purpose was, um, highlights of the book, what's in it, and I'm going to focus on people and individuals that had a great deal to do with Glenn Miller <coughs> in uniform, many of whom we have not necessarily in the past um, recognized or known about. And lastly, I'm going to give a summary of the findings in the book, uh, but there are many more findings. Uh, but these are the prime ones. And I'm going to focus specifically on the events of December 15, 1944, rather than the full scope of Glenn's military history. And hopefully we'll have a lot of time left for questions and answers, which there may be some. I want to dedicate this. This is the dedication that's in the front of the book. The Glenn Miller Declassified is dedicated to Stephen Davis Miller and Johnny D. Miller Hoffman. And there's a quote from T.S. Eliot, which I thought was very apt. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. In other words, we've started with a premise that Glenn Miller boarded an aircraft, and it was lost over the English Channel. Over a 72-year period, many people again, with good or not so good intentions, have challenged that initial outlook. And this quote might give you a hint as to where we end up in, in the end of the day. Now the rationale for the book, uh, before I give the rationale, I want to give a little bit of a promotion. And I'll read this. Dennis Sprague not only brings Miller's entire professional life and career into sharp focus, he artfully weaves together strands of military, aviation, political, and cultural history to produce what is sure to be the definitive biography of this dedicated patriot and gifted entertainer. Glenn Miller Declassified is a richly researched and wonderfully crafted work. And this is signed by Dr. Mark J. Conversino. He's a colonel in the United States Air Force. He is the deputy commandant and Professor of Strategy and Security Studies of the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies at the Air University, Maxwell Gunter Air Force Base, Alabama. A wonderful member <coughs> and a great helper to me on this project. The purpose of Glenn Miller Declassified when we started on it was to close seven day of decades of what the military would call scuttlebutt. And the reason for the, this seven decades of scuttlebutt, the primary reasons in my estimation, are first and foremost an absence of physical evidence. Aircraft debris was never found. There was a 78 hour time gap between the dispatch of this aircraft and the moment in which Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force realized that one of their primary public relations assets was missing. And then made inquiries to try to find him. There was a state of emergency existent due to a German offensive that had been mounted the morning of December 16, 1944, that we now know to be the Battle of the Bulge. Glenn Miller's aircraft departed on the afternoon of December 15th. From the morning of the 16th forward, Allied forces and, and um, officials were somewhat preoccupied with other matters. <laughs> Following this initial series of circumstances that, that worked against finding anything were the wartime security and post-war document access standards of the Army Air Forces. You have to remember this was in wartime there was going to be no release of specific details, even if they knew them. They would only release a general statement. Post-war document access was limited by the fact that most of the documentation that had to do with the aircraft, 
the pilot and the unit in which this aircraft came from was boxed for storage, shipment to the United States or the National Archives because immediate, somewhat immediately after these events, the 8th Air Force was transferred to the Pacific Theater of Operations. You, you military aficionados might remember this, but all the B-17s and B-24s were flown back to the United States, most of which were scrapped. The 8th Air Force became a B-29 operation, so all the, all the airmen had to transition. The administrative personnel in England had to be sent home. They had millions upon millions of boxes of documents that somebody had to say, which ones do we keep? How do we keep them? Which ones do we destroy? There was nothing nefarious or conspiratorial about that process. It was just a matter of physically not being able to bring everything home. Lastly, and as time goes along and I do more cross comparisons, I feel very, very strong about this. There were errors and omissions in Don Haynes' diary that were misunderstood to be accurate. Don wrote a diary contemporaneous with these events that was lost after the World War II. And in 1953, he was hired by Universal International to construct some of the script for the movie The Glenn Miller Story. He reconstructed his diary from memory. It, is mostly, it mostly can be corroborated by other sources, but it is not necessarily 100% accurate or reliable. The mission statement for Glenn Miller Declassified. We started with something very simple. The Glenn Miller Archive was concerned and responsible about Glenn Miller's legacy. We were noticing over time, particularly because Steve was very angry about a lot of these things, legends, distortions, conjecture, as well as valid questions, about what happened to his father. Glenn Miller and his family, in my opinion, never deserved disrespect. And many authors and invest, so-called investigators showed them great disrespect. And many things about Major Miller that were preposterous. And I still, I myself bear some resentment about that. But I've tried to be objective. I was authorized by Stephen Miller to tell the whole story, however the chips may fall, and that's very important. This book is not an attempt, was, was never set out to be, and is not today, an attempt to substantiate or prove a point of view. It was an attempt to resolve the matter once and for all. In fact, resolved was the original proposed title for the book, as you all know. And we wanted to assemble the complete history of Glenn Miller's military service to place people and organizations in context. Along the way, we have been very blessed. We have received the complete cooperation and access to all, and I repeat, all extant records that exist in the United Kingdom and the United States with regard to Major Glenn Miller. Now, I want to say something very important, because I know I'll get questions about this now and into the future. And to be candid with you, I was very scared to get up here today, and I've been very reluctant to publish the book, because I feel like I'm going to be torn to shreds by some people who don't want to accept the facts. There may be opinions, points of view, out there that are not in um, and as you will see, in, in, in alignment with what I'm about to tell you. However, none of the people pressing for alternative histories have ever produced one, and I mean one, factual piece of evidence to support their points of view. And I welcome someday that to happen. It hasn't. I'm starting to sound like Steve. <laughs> now, the methodology of the project from 2010 through 2015, meticulous on-site collection and examination of evidence. 
and a lot of expense, which my wife kept saying, what the hell are you doing? Why are you going to England? Why are you spending month after month in, in Montgomery, Alabama, of all, what's there? What's there? She didn't mind Washington, D.C. so much because we have relatives in D.C. and she could come too. Um, this may be a conservative estimate, but there are somewhat in the neighborhood of 4,000 documents and 50,000 pages of evidence that have been gathered for this book. And it's a meticulous and thorough searches of files. And I will share something with you, and you're going to think I'm nuts. There have been several times along the way, either at the Air Force in Alabama, where they keep all their historic records, at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., or at the National Archives of the United Kingdom in Kew Gardens, or the BBC written archive in Caversham, that I have found things or opened files that I had no real logical reason to go into, and I found things. And you, you, at that point, you step back and you say, this is kind of eerie. I don't know who out there in the beyond wants me to find this stuff. You start saying to yourself, what is this? Maybe that's just being punch drunk about being in archives too long and, and getting glazed over. We wanted to verify all documents and records, and all documented records. The point was to cross-examine data from multiple sources. You know, you can look at one piece of paper and see someone's opinion or observation. You know, the police tell you after an automobile accident, an hour after an accident, six people who saw the accident will give you six different stories. So you really need to cross-examine all of the points of view and, and testimonies. Also, with great respect and love, I must say that World War II veteran testimonies given to me personally when people are in their 90s or to others earlier when they were in their 80s and 70s are not necessarily reliable. They may be, they may not be. We wanted to critically review new versus previous data because I was accumulating information that I had not seen before from other sources. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't going off on tangents or wild goose chases. We wanted to assemble accurate and clear timelines. I can't stress enough that in a good history, especially in this situation, A, you do not want to look at with hindsight, with clear hindsight of what happened. You want to put yourself in the position of the people at the time looking forward. You want to also assemble and build what happened at 8 in the morning, 9 in the morning, 10 in the morning, especially on a day like December 15, 1944, where events were in motion in different places at different times. Very important in understanding who did what, whether the plane was bombed out of the sky by Lancasters, whether Glenn was really on it, who knew he was on it, where the pilot came from, why he was flying such a plane on such a mission, etc. We wanted to um, go and through and factually eliminate alternative theories one by one. First, starting with non-aviation related scenarios, uh, including claims that Glenn Miller was a, was a clandestine agent among them, and aviation related scenarios. Um, when you get, when you read this book, you'll see one chapter especially might read like an NTSB examination of, a, of an airplane crash. That's probably true, but that's after six years of working with Air Force forensics people who investigate crashes. They're very factual. We decided to produce something in 2016 and 17 um, that um, continued on this same path and this just repeats the things that I said before. Now, if you want to learn more about this um, story, that I don't tell you in the next 15 minutes. Please go to this website, www.dennismsprague.com. It's been set up with the help of the public relations people of the University of Nebraska Press, and the chapters of the book, contents of the book, photographs, eventually a lot of photographs and documents that don't make it into the actual book, 400 page book, are going to be posted at this site. 
Now, starting with a bit of, of levity, what do you think Glenn Miller has in common with the movie Planet of the Apes? <laughs> Probably nothing you thought, nor did I, except that I found out that after Glenn Miller entered the United States Army, and he was assigned to the Army Specialist Corps Class 17 at Fort Meade, Maryland, for a two-week course, his one of the colleagues in his class, in addition to Captain Wayne King, another band leader, was Captain Maurice Evans, a Shakespearean actor of some repute, who played the role later in life as Dr. Zayas, the educated orangutan leader of the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> Captain Evans wrote a memoir called All This in Evans Two. And in all this in Evans too, he remembers being at this Army Service Corps um, course and being in music theory classes with Captain Glenn Miller. And Evans said, I used to love waiting and watching for Miller's head to explode during these sessions that must have been pretty boring and obnoxious to him. He said, I just loved watching him get irritated. I think Marie Sevens had a great sense of humor. Glenn Miller went into the United States Army Air Force as a director of bands training for the Army Air Force's Technical Training Command. He was transferred from the Army Specialist Corps immediately following completion of Class 17 at Fort Bead. In fact, it was only a matter of three days from the time Glenn received orders to return to the 7th Corps District in Omaha, Nebraska that he got orders to report to Maxwell Field, Montgomery, Alabama. Um, I don't have it here, but on the website, you'll see a, a, a document from the headquarters of the Army Air Forces, General H.H. H. Arnold, um, requesting Miller services from General Bretton Somerville, head of the Army Service Corps, and General Somerville approved it. Um, the Army Air Forces knew who Glenn Miller was. It was not a clerical accident that he entered the Army Air Forces because they had a job that fit him perfectly. They decided that he was a recruiting, fundraising, and public awareness diamond in the rough, a national legend that they could co-opt and use. Remember, in 1942, no one in the United States, at least among civilians, knew what an Air Force was or what had to be done to build it. But Glenn Miller could tell them that via radio broadcasts. Glenn was hired to build a network of AAF bands, which he did. Many veterans have come to us over the years and said, I worked with or for Glenn Miller in the, in the military. And you look at the records of the Army Air Forces band and you don't find them. But you would find them among the 300 other Army Air Force bands that were scattered around the country that Glenn recruited people for, and he might have auditioned many of them. So they, they have valid reasons to say they worked for or with Glenn Miller, even if indirectly. He had a big job, but in addition to that big job, he was also tasked with creating an elite radio production unit based in New York that would have top echelon major talent that would broadcast weekly over the NBC network, as you know, and it was called I Sustain the Wings. General Henry Harley Arnold was very important and key to Glenn Miller's entry into the military, and he will factor in later in the story. The mission of the Army Air Forces, as laid out by General Arnold in a statement in 1941 when it was formed from the old Army Air Corps, was to develop and manufacture aircraft in massive quantities, establish a global logistics network to supply, maintain, and repair the Army Air Forces. And as relates to Glenn Miller, two important goals. Recruit and train flying and technical personnel. Sustain the health, welfare, and morale of AAF personnel. And guess who fit that one to a T? Glenn's was assigned to, like I said, the technical training command. There were two tech training commands in 42. Technical, all the ground personnel, and flying, the um, obviously the pilots, navigators, bombardiers, air crew. Those were merged in 1943 into one training command. It was commanded by Major General Barton K. Yount, who was a West Point classmate of General Arnold's. General Yount's wife, Mildred Yount, headed the committee in 1937 
that had a national contest to come up with a song for the Air Force, which became the Army Air Corps song that you know. So Ms. And Mrs. Yount was a child prodigy musician, pianist. So she had a great interest in music. And I'm going to di digress one moment to mention the fact that Captain Glenn Miller inadvertently made her furious. He was in Fort Worth, Texas, visiting General Yount for a meeting, and Mrs. Yount had invited him to a garden party at her home. He took the time to go visit with Master Sergeant Harry Bluestone and musicians of the Army Air Force's radio production unit at Fort Worth and lost track of the time and stood Mrs. Yount up. And we have a memo where he, he says something to the effect of, I think I've kind of made Mrs. Y mad. <laughs> you don't want to anger the wife of the commanding general of the, of the service here. The AAF Training Command was known as the world's biggest university, and not without reason. There were more people in the Training Command than any other branch of the armed forces. It was big, because you were training people how to fly, repair aircraft. Headquarters was Fort Worth, as I said, importantly, You've heard that Glenn Miller was up against opposition the whole time he was in the armed forces. Wrong. Headquarters Army Air Forces, General Arnold. Headquarters Training Command backed him 110%. They wanted him to succeed. General Young, in fact, gave, Steve told me this once and I wasn't sure until I found it in the files. General Young told Captain Miller, sign my name. This is a captain. Now, what does that create among music officers who are majors and colonels at Army Air Force bases around the country? Resentment. So Glenn had the full support of the people that mattered. You know, you've heard the story where um, Glenn said in the movie, the Glenn Miller story, that they said, what are you doing playing blues? And Glenn says, well, were you still flying the same planes you were flying in the First World War? That's actually a true story. It happened in New Haven, Connecticut. It was a major who was a music officer who said that to him. But what you didn't see in the movie was that the colonel who commanded New Haven thought it was hilarious and, thought, and, and backed Glenn 100% and just blew the major off. <laughs> However, Glenn did get under the skin of somebody named General George C. Marshall, which is someone also you did not want to irritate because he was chief of staff of the United States Army. Some of you may know that in August of 1943, Glenn was quoted in, Time in a Time Magazine article saying anyone can improve on Sousa, and that Army bands have been doing an awful job. And General Arnold was very sensitive. He took a keen interest in the United States Army band. In fact, General Marshall, in a meeting with the British Combined Chiefs of Staff and the American Chiefs of Staff, talking about Operation Torch in 1942. General Walter Bedell Smith, his chief of staff at the time, remembered that the general went off on a tangent talking about the United States Army Band and why he was kind of angry that they weren't doing as much as the Army Air Forces to hire good talent and appeal to the young people. And the combined British chiefs of staff and American chiefs of staff were puzzled as to why he did this, because there were more important and pressing matters. Um, he was very angry about the Sousa comments and the Army Band comments. He wrote to Arnold, who in turn wrote to um, Yount, who in turn had um, Colonel Daly, Miller's direct report, come to Miller and say, by what authority do you comment on Army Bands? Glenn said, well, I was misquoted. <laughs> so Glenn sent a letter to Time Magazine demanding a retraction, and Yount sent that back to Arnold as their reply, which is basically to say, we don't care what Miller says, we support it. And um, that went back to Marshall and Marshall, nothing else came of it. <laughs> Colonel Edward Montague Kirby, probably the most important person other than Glenn Miller in this book. Colonel Kirby had been Director of Public Relations for the National Association of Broadcasters before World War II, and prior to that, he was promotion manager of WSM Nashville, Tennessee, where he discovered and promoted the career of a woman named Dinah Shore. He met with Captain Glenn, at the time of this slide, he is the um, director of broadcasting 
for the War Department Bureau of Public Relations. He's a chief radio officer in the Pentagon. He meets with Glenn Miller and Technical Sergeant Paul Dudley, Glenn's number one man. His producer, Paul Dudley, was really the number two guy in this organization. And they met between I Sustain the Wings broadcasts on April 29th of 1944, at which time Colonel Kirby wanted Glenn's recommendation for musicians because they were forming a new radio network in England at Shafe, he was going to be transferred to England and he wanted Glenn's recommendations on what musicians or bands that he might recommend be transferred to the UK. Well, you know what his answer was, me. And that led to a meeting, two days of meetings on May 8th and 9th of 1944 in Washington, where Glenn, Dudley, and Kirby laid out the plans. Ostensibly, everybody was told they were, Glenn was consulting with them on plans for European radio broadcasting. What Glenn was doing was laying out the plans for the transfer of his units to Europe. This is the message that was sent from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force to the War Department in Washington, to wit General Dwight David Eisenhower, to Generals Arnold and Marshall. They're the addressees. He requests the service of Glenn Miller to staff a radio network they're about to create. This memo has a background. Glenn Miller required Kirby to get somebody of stature at Chafe to ask for his, to request his services because he thought the Army Air Forces would reject any, any um, request he or someone in the United States would make. In fact, they already had. They wanted to keep him here because he was too valuable. They could not turn down Eisenhower, and Glenn knew that. And here we have General Eisenhower who had recommended a, an allied radio service. Bear in mind, there was something called the BBC, which had troop broadcasting services, and we had something called Armed Forces Radio Service that had troop broadcasting services, neither of whom were necessarily interested in cooperating with one another to build a third service which combined American and British assets. Eisenhower's number two man in this area was General Ray Barker, Deputy, Com Deputy Commander of Shave, Assistant Chief of Staff, or what they call G1. He would be responsible for Shave Broadcasting. General Barker, who you've probably read about in many other books, you may not know, in 1916 he was part of the Pancho Villa Expedition under General Pershing. He had a long and rich history in the United States as a cavalryman and later an artillery officer in the First World War. Another person of great interest in Glenn Miller to classify is Colonel John S. Hayes. Prior to World War II, he was the general manager of WOR in New York. Um, he ended up being sent to Europe to start something called American Forces Network in 1943. He ended up as also in dual role as deputy commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces Program, which was the network Eisenhower was founding. Um, the BBC resisted the establishment of AFN in 1943, and AFRS in Los Angeles wasn't happy because they didn't control it either. It was pretty much controlled by Shafe, which was the main authority in the UK at the time. The reason the British did not want AFN or American Radio to become established in the UK was quite straightforward. They felt that when the war ended, they would be subject to American commercial broadcasting or the model of American commercial broadcasting, which they found abhorrent. Now, this is the original signal contour, proposed signal contour map for the transmitter that Eisenhower was going to build. He didn't have to build it, it already existed at the BBC, it was called Start Point. It was a 150,000 watt AM signal. They did not use short wave because people in Europe and the Allied troops had AM medium wave receivers. They didn't have short wave receivers. Um, BBC, for internal purposes, called it the BBC Violet Network. They put color codes on all the networks to switch 
the, the equipment when they had to switch programs and do the programming studies and everything else. AEFP was 50-50 American and British Canadian. The Canadians loved this. The BBC had not been allowing the Canadians a lot of CBC programming. Um, they were kind of being mean to them. So from the Canadian point of view, this was great because they suddenly got more programming. And they were very happy with this, even if the Americans and British weren't necessarily. This is William John Haley. He was Director General of the BBC and he was adamantly opposed to the creation of the AEFP. He had an ally in AFRS, but you will find out in Glenn Miller Declassified that Eisenhower sent a memo to Sir Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Churchill responded about the BBC and saying, I'm going to do this. I would like their cooperation. And Sir, eventually Sir, Sir William um, responded to Eisenhower and said, no, but we will give you an alternative. We'll let you have a separate transmitter for your AFN. Eisenhower got back to Churchill. Churchill first responded saying, quote, my dear Eisenhower, as you can now see, the BBC are beyond even my considerable powers of persuasion. <laughs> but at the same time, Churchill sent a note to Brendan Bracken, who the BBC was the minister in the British government that the BBC reported to. And he told Bracken to tell the BBC that if they didn't obey Eisenhower, he was going to seize facilities and transmitters from them and give them to Eisenhower. <laughs> So with, in short order, the BBC gladly cooperated with Schaaf. The catch was Schaaf had to allow the BBC to run the service. The BBC said, okay, fine. If you're gonna dragoon us into this, we have to run it. AEFP went on the air at 5.30 in the morning on June 7th, 1944, D plus one. What's very interesting about that it's not that it went on the air, not that it turned out to be a wonderful service. Churchill forced Bracken, who forced the BBC, to approve it on May 19, 1944. An entire combined allied radio broadcasting service was formed and built in only three weeks. And the people of Broadcasting House in London knew something was afoot when uniformed American MPs descended on the sixth and seventh floors of the building and sealed them off. And only people with specific security passes could get in because they had to keep it a secret because if it, it, it leaked that this was being formed, people would know where the invasion might, when it might be coming and where it might be going. Morris Gorham, not Maurice, Morris Gorham, an Irishman, not an Englishman, an Irishman. You didn't know that. Morris Gorham is one of the most misunderstood people in the story of Glenn Miller. He has historically been inaccurately and unfairly stereotyped as a BBC stuffed shirt. He wasn't. He was actually kind of a rebel in the BBC establishment if you look at his work history. He had been the director of North American programming and programs for the BBC Overseas Service. Hence, when William Haley decided, okay, I've got this hot potato that I've got to agree to, and we're going to run it, who among my staff should I have become director of AEFP? Well, the man on my staff that knows the most about working with Americans is Morris Gorham. Hence, he got the job. Working with Morris Gorham, someone who was dragooned into this as well, Lieutenant Colonel James David Niven. This is a subject for another book unto itself. <laughs> this was a soldier who became an actor and then returned to military duty. Do you guys know that David Niven was a graduate of Sandhurst? That he served a tour of duty in the Royal Army before he went to Hollywood? The circumstances of his departure from the Royal Army and appearance in Hollywood are somewhat vague. In 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, he returned to the UK and put on his uniform, put his uniform back on. The British Embassy in Washington had advised Brits in, Wa in Hollywood to stay in Hollywood. David didn't, he went back. He is a major factor 
in the Glenn Miller story. He was, he thought, finally free of film work for the British government. Because he got back to England, the first thing they did was put him in movies. He wanted to be a commando. Um, his biography, autobiographies, and all books that have been written about him will tell you absolutely nothing about his um, connection with AEFP. Memoirs of people like Cecil Madden will say, oh, David popped in for meetings now and again, but he didn't really do much. That's false. He was a hands-on manager, and he was a good one. Um, I've been through dozens, if not hundreds, of memos written by David Niven, and he gave clear orders, and he didn't tolerate any nonsense. Cecil Madden was named program director and head producer for the AEFP. He worked closely with Glenn's producers, who were Staff Sergeant George Vutsas, whose pre-war assignment had been the NBC Symphony Orchestra broadcast with Arturo Toscanini and Leopold Stokowski, and Technical Sergeant Paul Dudley, who before being in uniform was the producer of Coca-Cola Spotlight Bands. They were the AEM Brain Trust, arguably the most important, a most if not the most important factor in the success of the Army Air Forces Band Special, as it was known when it was deployed overseas, because it was deployed as a, as a unit still under control of the AAF, but assigned to Shafe. Now we all know this quote is very important to say at this stage. Next to a letter from home, your band is the greatest morale booster in the ETO. General James H. Doolittle, Commanding General 8th Air Force. This is going appearing at an air base. We all know about this. This band made a tremendous impact, not just on the armed forces of the United States and the United Kingdom, for which it was intended. It had a tremendous impact upon the people of the United Kingdom, who heard its broadcasts clearly, the people of the occupied countries of Europe, and the people of the German Reich. They maintained a very robust schedule, as you know. Concerts and personal appearances would have been exhausting, and were exhausting. Among their radio broadcasts, the American Band of the AEF featuring the whole orchestra, Swing Shift led by Sergeant Ray McKinley, the dance band, basically the orchestra without strings, Uptown Hall, Mel Powell, Soldier in a Song, Johnny Desmond, and of course, Strings with Wings, Sergeant George Ochner. The Strings with Wings string section had a great admirer, Sir Adrian Bolt, the director of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, who dropped in on their rehearsals from time to time just to listen to them because he admired them. By the way, Glenn got in trouble with Sir Adrian. Um, he invited him to appear on a Strings with Wings broadcast, not with Sir Adrian, but with the BBC. He invited Sir Adrian and Bolt said, of course I will. I'd love to direct them on one of the broadcasts. So they did it. And within about one day, there's a memo from some people at the BBC saying, where did Glenn Miller get permission and authority from us to use Sir Adrian Bolt on one of his broadcasts? Now, this may make, make you reassess Morris Gorham. Morris Gorham got that, told David Niven about it, and they decided to throw it in the wastebasket because they didn't want to bother Glenn with it. They, were, they just didn't want to bother him. <laughs> Mixed signals. While Glenn was there, Glenn, remember, Glenn had come as the protege of Ed Kirby. Ed Kirby had a confrontational personality. He had different ideas about how to run AEFP, and he clashed with the BBC. It got very nasty, very nasty, to the point at which Kirby was ordered back to Washington. In the midst of this, Glenn almost got caught up in it. Glenn had penned a memo really slamming the BBC and some of their procedures, much of which he was not qualified to state because he didn't know exactly what they were doing or why. But he, Kirby might as well have written the memo Glenn wrote. Niven intercepted it and, and, and absconded with all the copies to protect Glenn. And um, that saved Glenn. This is a picture that Glenn gave Ed Kirby. And it says, this must be the way I looked when we had lunch with PFC Gorman. That was not a term of endearment. Glenn and Morris Gorman would come to respect and actually like each other. But at this time, 
Glenn was subject to feeling as though the BBC was his enemy, and they weren't. Now, Big Crosby came, of course, to visit, and these people had mutual admiration and respect for one another. Two comments. When Bing, and Bing was rehearsing with the band on August 31st, 1944, before appearing with them, Glenn, they finished up the rehearsal, running through the songs, and Glenn says, okay, guys, I think we need to do this one more time. To it, Bing Crosby says, Glenn, my dear boy, my dear, this is according to Kirby, Glenn, my dear fellow, these, these, these young men, they're fine, they're good. Don't worry, just give us the cue when we go on the air and we'll nail it. And so what's Glenn, Glenn Miller supposed to say in front of his band to Bing Crosby? Yes, that's what he said, fine. Which kind of is interesting. But then Bing Crosby rolls in a tray full of bottles of scotch whiskey. <laughs> which is another taboo in Glenn Miller rehearsals. Which some members of the band would remember as being almost like church services. They were so religious. They were so well organized and so well choreographed. He, he boom, boom, boom. His rehearsals were a thing to behold to people who had been in them. Bing disrupted the whole thing. <laughs> Glenn, what could Glenn do? They really cared for each other. However, Glenn did not care, especially for a woman named Dinah Shore. Unfortunately, there was tension between them. Colonel Kirby, Glenn's protege and boss, was urging Glenn to work with her and work closely with her and even make a series of records with her at Abbey Road Studios. The problem was, on August 3rd, 1944, when Dinah showed up at the European Theater, she shows up in Bedford to be on the air with the American Band of the AEF. They bump scheduled guest Earl Davis, who's supposed to be on the show, and Dinah says something to Glenn, which all of you who know Glenn will immediately recognize as a no-no. She says, here are my arrangements that I brought with me, and I would like your copyists to make copies of all of them for your band to perform on the air. And they have, and Glenn looks at his watch, I'm admitting this, Glenn look, kind of looks at his watch, I think, and notices that he's got about eight hours. And he looked at her and said very clearly, no, you will sing Sergeant Johnny Desmond's parts. That was the only one thing that got under his skin. Later, before this recording session that you see a picture of, September 16, 1944, the day before, uh, she appears the evening before at an air base concert with the band led by Ray McKinley because Glenn is sick in bed. He has to get up the next day out of his sick bed and come and hang out with her at this recording session, at which time Ray says, she was very angry that you weren't there, so she pushed us to the background and put her USO troop out in front of us and made us a pit band. And Glenn Miller's response was very clear. After this recording session, and by the way, Dinah Shore left England six days after this session and came back to the U.S. After this, this one, I do not want, wish to work with this woman ever again. And I think he meant it. Um, she returned home with arrangements that Kirby had convinced Glenn to write, because they had some advanced warning. They did write two arrangements for her for this recording session. She took them home and immediately copied them and gave them to people like Meredith Wilson to play on RFRS broadcasts in LA and network broadcasts in LA. So when you hear broadcasts in 45 that sound like Stardust and all I do is dream of you and you go, wow, that sounds like the Glenn Miller arrangement even though it's Meredith Wilson. It is, they are the Miller arrangements. Underneath Dinah's persona was a very ambitious and in my estimation, um, brilliant, smart woman. But she was just as ambitious as Glenn was. One more subject before we get to aviation. Music for the Wehrmacht. Music for die Wehrmacht. Not the Wehrmacht Tower. Music for die Wehrmacht. The broadcast of the American Broadcasting Station in Europe. The European Division of the Voice of America. This is a picture of Glenn Miller with Ilza. Her name is Lieutenant Gloria Wagner. All of the German-speaking announcers on ABSI used pseudonyms on the air to protect themselves because they were American citizens who had families in Germany. You might correctly guess that Gloria Wagner was related to 
Wagner, the composer. AEFP also employed someone named Sergeant Golo Mann, the son of Thomas Mann, and others. It was a very effective, interesting unit. We talk more about it in the book, but I wanted you to see Gloria Wagner. Man, November 14, 1944, Glenn Miller is summoned to appear before General Walter Cadell Smith, formerly Chief of Staff for General Marshall, now Chief of Staff for General Eisenhower, because Marshall sent Smith to be Eisenhower's deputy so he would know what Eisenhower was doing, essentially. Smith calls Miller in for me. Miller doesn't know why he's been summoned. You know this to be an abrupt 30-second meeting. It lasted at least five minutes. It was scheduled for 15 minutes. And according to General Smith's Rolodex and Daily Diary, which we've read, Glenn Miller declined an offer from General George C. Marshall to lead the United States Army Band. He was offered a promotion to Colonel and to lead the Army Band. But there was something about this that he didn't know. At this time, the U.S. Army Band was in the European theater. It was a marching band. They were performing in Europe at this very time. If Glenn Miller had accepted this offer, he was not headed back to Washington. He was going to be in France leading a marching band at the same time his elite radio unit, AAF unit, was in the theater. One cannot imagine that possibly ever happening. Glenn Miller declined the offer, which Shafe was very happy that he did, because guess what? Do you really think that General Eisenhower and General Smith wanted Glenn Miller to leave? No, 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 no. But what Glenn did in this meeting was very important, and you see it in the memo from Marshall, excuse me, from Smith to General Barker. It's a very quick memo. He says, Miller declines offer. Supreme Commander approves transfer. AAF Band Special, UK to Far Shore. Meaning, Glenn, somehow in this meeting, by something he said or something Smith deduced, Smith approved the move of the band from England to France. So, the band goes off to France, or is going to be going off to France. Glenn Miller made a proposal after meeting with Smith. There were a series of meetings that Smith wasn't involved in. It was Glenn, Niven, other AEFP people like Hayes. And they decided to move the band to France. There was a catch. BBC needed reliable programming. Glenn um, agreed to do pre-record 83 programs, 20 and three quarters hours worth of programs, use a theater called the Marini Theater in Paris that the BBC had already wired for broadcast, but he really wanted the Olympia Theater, which was controlled by the Americans, because it was larger. But it hadn't yet been wired, and that work was just getting underway. When Glenn Miller and the band were in England, they were housed within the 8th Air Force. 8th Air Force um, fed them, basically, in Bedford. 8th Air Force was commanded from High Wycombe, a station called Pine Tree. As you all know, the commanding officer was General James H. Doolittle. His immediate number two deputy commander of operations was General Orville A. Anderson. Orville Anderson was married to Loretta Maud Miller of Clarinda, Iowa. She was Glenn Miller's first cousin. General Anderson, the number two man in the 8th Air Force, was Glenn's cousin-in-law. When Glenn Miller went missing, General Anderson took, as you will see in a moment, serious steps to find out what the hell happened. Eighth Air Force Service Command was the garage of Eighth Air Force. They fixed the planes. They kept the planes flying. The AAF Band Special was billeted at Eighth Air Force Service Command headquarters of Milton Ernest Hall, nicknamed the Castle, outside of Bedford, where they ate their meals. Um, this is a picture of the second strategic air depot at Abbott's Ripton, which was 17 miles northeast of uh, Milton Ernest, and it was adjacent to the Alkenberry Air Base, which was a B-17 field. The um, 
air depots didn't have runways. They were repair stations that were attached to bases with runways where planes were flown in to be repaired. One of the officers of Milton Ernest, actually the headquarters commandant, was Lieutenant Colonel Norman Francis Bazell of Washington, D.C., a greatly misunderstood character. Um, at the time the band came to the UK, like I said, he was headquarters commandant. He later, in August of 44, was switched. He became liaison officer for service command with the responsibility of building a new air depot on, in France or Belgium, depending upon where he decided to place it. Colonel Bazell was a character, brusque character. He has been falsely portrayed as a criminal by conspiracy theorists. He may have been a lot of things, but he was not a criminal. Colonel Bazell was, could be akin to the manager of a country club. And he befriended Don Haynes, Glenn's administrative officer, and Glenn, and they all became poker partners and they knew each other very well. 8th Air Force Service Command flew a fleet of Nordeen C-64 Norseman aircraft. These aircraft were built outside of Montreal, Quebec. Um, the, and they were about 210 of them in 8th and 9th Air Force in England. Um, they were workhorse aircraft. They were used to move people and spare parts between air bases. I, I sometimes tell people that the C-64s were like the FedEx and UPS of their day. They were, they were moving small packages, spare parts, and people around. Um, they had a 1,010 mile range. They were flown regularly across the channel between England and France, every single day in fact. They were fitted with a Pratt & Whitney R1340 AN1 engine which, as I said yesterday, was the same engine that was on Amelia Earhart's plane. They were fitted with a Stromberg Carlson float-type carburetor, just like the carburetors on automobiles. More modern aircraft were fitted with um, float-free carburetors. Um, the Stromberg Carlson carburetor was built, was, was, was manufactured in Rochester, New York. The engine, Pratt & Whitney engine, was, of course, from Bridgeport, Connecticut. The aircraft was fitted with an SCR-274N four-channel radio. The pilot could communicate on one channel and monitor three other channels simultaneously. The aircraft radio at low altitude had only a 25 to 50 mile range, but at higher altitude, the range could be extended to perhaps 100 miles. Importantly, because these aircraft were on missions to go back and forth across the channel, they were fitted with a VHF ILS transmitter so the pilot could make an instrument land weather. So these were not, um, uh, you might have known this aircraft to be without a lot of good equipment on it. It had great equipment. Flight Officer Stuart Morgan was the pilot assigned to Colonel Bazell. He was experienced. He was instrument rated. He was qualified and trusted. He flew a lot of senior officers around the European theater. And he had flown back and forth across the channel many times. Lieutenant Don Haynes, administrative officer of the unit. We're going to talk to, about him a little bit now, and we're going to you're going to read a lot much more about him in the book. You're going to learn a lot of things about Don for the first time. Not all good, not all bad, but who he really was and what he really did. There were questions of his priorities and his responsibilities of his administrative officer that Glenn would have to handle around this period of time that added to Grant Glenn's otherwise um, maxed out stress level. There was a sense of urgency on December 15, 1944. Um, the Paris U.S. Army controlled broadcasting venue, Olympia Theater, was not yet ready. Glenn had made a commitment to Shafe and to the BBC, a number of commitments. Pre-recorded programs, have broadcast studios ready to go when we got there. Um, he also agreed to use a British theater, the Marigny Theater, which had already been wired. However, Don Haynes went over to set up all the arrangements. 
and set up their hotel they would be staying at, set up the place they would eat. But remember, Don was administrative officer of the unit. He had not dealt with the BBC. He had not dealt with those types of things Glenn had, Paul Dudley had. For whatever reason, Don did not meet with the BBC people, did not meet at the Marini Theater, and did not set that up, which left Glenn hanging, because Glenn had stuck his neck out, and these arrangements were not all finalized. Glenn's boss, Lieutenant Colonel David Niven, um, Gunn was very concerned about Don and what had been done or not done. Um, about a month before this, Glenn had given Don a one-week furlough and thinking he'd go to London or to Scotland. Don went to Paris. Furloughs in Paris were um, discouraged, greatly discouraged. Usually to get to Paris, you had to have a business reason. Don didn't. And Don, Norm Vizel said, well, just hitch a ride on one of our planes and go to Paris and you can bunk in with me in my hotel room. Niven found out about it and he was infuriated for evident reasons. Um, so Niven gave Glenn a direct order on December 11th, 1944. Don was going to be the person on the plane flying ahead of the band to make arrangements or to finalize the arrangements that were still hanging. Niven said to Glenn, no, I want you to come over. You and I are going to fix everything, and we're going. I, but we have to discuss Haynes. Now think about this. Glenn's under severe pressure to finish arrangements so the band can come over to France, and on top of that, his best friend, his secretary's husband, because Don's wife was Glenn's secretary in New York, and Glenn's wife's Helen's best friend. Glenn was facing the prospect of disciplining Don. This was not, so you can imagine his state of mind, which was, you can imagine his state of mind. A perfect storm had formed. And I, I know this is a lot, but let me just read these lines and not comment. Maintenance perform, was performed on a C-64 aircraft December 12th, and the aircraft passed the maintenance. This aircraft was 447025, which would be the plane that Glenn Miller would board three days later, piloted by Morgan. On the morning of December 15, 1944, after several days of cooling their heels and waiting to be able to go to back to Paris, um, Bazell told Morgan, um, we're just going. Whatever the case, we got to get there because Bazell was under pressure from his command to get his job done, which was to build an air depot, which also hadn't been finished yet. So you had two men, Miller and Bazell, who both were in a rush to get across that channel. However, Miller was author Morgan. Excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Morgan shows up at eight o'clock in the morning at Alkenberry Airfield. For clearance, he's denied instrument clearance. Why? Because the Paris area aerodromes are not necessarily going to be open that afternoon because of forecast bad weather. Now, Glenn was in London. He had tried to get on the authorized transport, the, AA, the Army Air Force's Air Transport Command shuttle flights that flew between London and Paris. That's what he was authorized to fly on, by his orders. Don knew Glenn was, had, 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 could not get on these flights because they'd been canceled. Don's having lunch with Norm Bazell on December 14th. Mentions to Norm that Glenn's cooling his heels in London. Norm says, let's call Glenn up. Glenn can ride with me. I authorize my own flight. I clear my own flight. I'm going. He can ride with me because when they resume these formal flights, he's going to get bumped by higher ranking officers. He's, in other words, he'll, he'll have to wait for another flight. He'll, he won't have priority. 
They call Glenn, Glenn agrees, Don goes to London, picks Glenn up, comes back out to Milton Ernest, they have dinner and play poker. Next morning they get up, Glenn and Don are waiting to go back to Milton Ernest, and Norm Bizzell is in Milton Ernest, and Pilot Morgan is flying to Milton Ernest from Alconbury to pick them up. Glenn, Norm Bizzell, and Don have lunch at Milton Ernest while they're waiting for Morgan because he hasn't gotten clearance yet. At the table next to Glenn and Norm and Don are all the senior officers of 8th Air Force Service Command, including Commanding General or Commanding Colonel James Early. The entire senior staff of the 8th Air Force Service Command knew that Norm Bazell was giving Glenn a ride. They did not ask Glenn or Don whether they had reported Miller's plans to Shafe. Shafe is assuming Glenn's going to be on a formal flight, scheduled flight. Those are grounded. They know that. So they assume Glenn is with the band. Remember I told you early on, think timelines. Think what people know at the time. At this very time Glenn's having lunch, getting ready to go out and get on a plane with Norm Bazell, his chain of command has no idea he's there or what his intentions are. The C-64 departs Altenberry. Morgan leaves. How? As an instrument-rated pilot, he has the right to file a visual flight plan, VFR, visual flight rules, meaning he has to stay in contact with the ground and fly underneath whatever cloud cover happens to be there. Remember, John Morgan is 22 years old. He's a flight officer. Norm Bazell is 44 years old. He's a colonel and a senior officer in the organization that Morgan works within. Do you really think Morgan's going to say, no, sir, I'm not going? <laughs> the C-64 is not flying IFR and thus was not entered into the air traffic control system because flight procedures were, when they approved an IFR flight plan, the departing station, in this case, Alconbury, reported the departure to Bobbington Air Traffic Control. Bobbington, in turn, sent a message via the moles hole at Pine Tree to an air base on the far shore saying, aircraft 4470285 has departed Alconbury 12.30 p.m. en route Villa Coblet or Orly, Paris. Um, estimated time of arrival 14.30. So the, the, the arriving station knows that there's a plane coming. That message was never sent because the pilot flew visual flight rules. And Alkenberry, for all they knew, he was only going to Twinwood and then going to make a decision from that point what he was going to do. Villa Coblet, therefore, the intended station of arrival, had no idea Morgan was coming. So not only did Shafe not know about the flight, AAF officials on the far shore didn't know about the flight. Morgan arrived at Twinwood at 1.45, 13.45, and he departed at 13.55. He was only on the ground 10 minutes. He left his engines idling, running, so they could, they could get, throw the guys on and go. Glenn and Bazell went out to the field and got on the plane and left. There were multiple witnesses that saw them do it. So if somebody were to tell you Glenn wasn't on that plane, that's not true. He was on the plane. They boarded. And something that I found astonishing when I found it out, looking at the records, there was a 3,000-foot overcast. No fog. Because people say, why would somebody fly it? All fogged in. It wasn't. It was typical British weather, winter weather. So remember, these guys had flown a reliable service with the C-64s for 90 days since the liberation of Paris, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Every day, and there had never been an incident so much as a scratch to any of these airplanes. So from their point of view, what the heck, they were going to be fine. They just had to fly underneath the clouds. 
underneath the overcast all the way. Now, Morgan had the option of stopping at Bobbington and refiling for an IFR clearance. He didn't, he kept going, which would lead you to perhaps believe that Bazell ordered him to keep going or neither one of them saw that there was a problem in front of them. There was no constant contact with this aircraft like in today's air traffic environment. Many of you will remember in 1956 that a TWA Constellation and a United Airlines DC-6 collided over the Grand Canyon. That caused the United States to finally adopt a, what they call a positive control air traffic system where they monitored every aircraft and it wasn't just everybody up there flying around. They, they finally realized that they needed to positively control aircraft. This was 12 years earlier. Radar that were in existence tracked high altitude bombing missions at 24,000 feet and coordinated those bombing missions. A transport aircraft down at 1,800 feet to 2,000 feet underneath the cloud deck was invisible to those radars. Nor was the pilot required to stay in touch with anyone. He took off, said somebody gave him clearance at 285, cleared for takeoff, he took off. He didn't have to check back in with anybody until he got to where he was landing, saying, this is 285, request landing instructions. From the time they took off at Twinwood to the time they were going to arrive at Villa Coblay, they were not required to talk to anyone. By the time the aircraft got out over the south coast and the English Channel, the ceiling had dropped to 2,000 feet. It might have gone down even lower over the water. It was still overcast, thick cloud. The clouds went up to about 4,000 feet, so if Morgan had decided to climb, he could have gone up to 5,000 feet and been clear of the weather and clear of ice. The te outside temperature on the ground when he took off at Twinwood was 34 degrees Fahrenheit. You can imagine what the temperature was at two to 3,000 feet in wet, conditions. Engine, wing, fuel line, and fuselage ice could form on that aircraft. Now I've got to get up and show you this. This is the air transport route that Morgan was required to fly. Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. There was something called a diver defense zone. Diver was the shape code word for the V-1 guided missiles, flying bombs, which were coming in. And they had anti-aircraft all over the southeast coast of England and fighter planes that were intercepting these flying bombs. The threat had gone down, it was still there. This zone was not removed till January of 45. All transport aircraft were required to fly west of London and only combat aircraft could fly to the east of London, and no aircraft could overfly London. So what they did was the air transport route, here's Bobbington, this is Bobbington, it ran southwest to North Holt, it's stuck on the chair. The aircraft would make a dog leg turn out here over a town called Maidenhead, and then proceed southeast to Langley Point, which is Beachy Head, and then cross the channel either over Dieppe to Orly Field in Paris, or over St. Valery to Villa Coblet Field in Paris. Morgan's flight path was to go southwest from Twinwood, overfly Bobbington, turn at Maidenhead, Fly over Dorking, Langley Point, St. Valery, Villa Coblet. He'd flown it 12 times. He knew where he was going. He was where he was supposed to be and he was on time. Between 2.30 and 2.45 that afternoon, the observation station at Beachy had observed a C-64 passing over them at 2,000 feet with American national insignia on it. There were no other C-64 aircraft aloft at that time. It was them. So the Army Air Forces realized later, when they found out what had happened, they had evidence, circumstantial evidence, 
that the aircraft had crossed out over the water. This is a message that was sent from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force to the War Department in Washington on December 22, 1944. And it basically says that Major Glenn Miller is missing. And they request that Mrs. Helen Miller of New Jersey be informed. Because on December 18th of 1944, Glenn Miller's band had arrived at Orly Field in Paris, and he was not there to meet them. And starting from that point forward, Schaefer and then Eighth Air Force frantically started looking for Miller, Bazell, Morgan, and the airplane. Actually, about 24 hours after the airplane had departed, the um, people at the Abbots Rifton 2nd Strategic Air Depot, a clerk, noticed that a pilot hadn't reported back in after 24 hours, which was not uncommon. These guys had always had sloppy paperwork. And they filed something called a missing air crew report, aircraft report. And they just put it in, and they put it, they filed it on an, on an inbox. He said, well, they'll get scout report. Morgan will report back in tomorrow or something. He probably diverted because of bad weather. Well, that wasn't the case, as we all know. So they had to tell Mrs. Miller that her husband was missing because the band was about to perform on radio in Paris. And it would be obvious that Glenn wasn't there. Now, you should know that in those days, Schaefer had strict rules with the press, and they had a gag order. After three or four days, the media knew Glenn wasn't there, and the band was, and rumors started flying. But if anybody had, were, were, unlike today, if any of the media had reported back to the U.S. that, flash, Glenn Miller missing, their credentials would have been seized by Schaefer, and they would have been either imprisoned or sent back to the United States and then imprisoned. They were pretty strict about secrecy. It was wartime. This is the casualty message that was sent to Helen Miller that's in the files of the United States of America. This is the full-color actual document. Most families in the Second World War, received a casualty telegram via Western Union. And you've seen movies where the Western Union uh, uh, courier is reluctant to go to the front door because they know what these telegrams are. The War Department and the Army Air Forces, particularly General H. H. Arnold, decided that a detail of two senior officers from the Pentagon would hand deliver this message to Mrs. Miller, which they did at 10 o'clock a.m. December 23, 1944, the last shopping day before Christmas because December 24th was a Sunday and the stores would be closed. You can imagine how an, an Army Air Force's major must have felt when he had to open his briefcase, take that message out, and hand it to her. One of the more emotional parts of the book. Now, last but not least, findings. <coughs> this is a very hard document to see. Many of the microfilm records at the United States Air Force and at the National Archives in Washington are almost illegible because the microfilming techniques that were used in the late 1940s have deteriorated, the films have deteriorated, and they faded. What this is, is something very important that, you, that we didn't previously know. On January 20th, 1945, Eighth Air Force convened a hearing. From about December 21st on, they had been interviewing eyewitnesses. They had started an investigation a phone call had been made by General Barker at Schaefer to Doolittle. Doolittle wasn't available, so Barker got on the phone with Anderson and explained, Glenn Miller is missing. Um, we don't know what to do. Actually, this is December 19th, I'm sorry. What do we do? 
What do you guys know? What can, it was your plane. Anderson says, I'm afraid they've had it. Because if you, if you didn't know this plane was missing, if we didn't know this was missing, it's three days later, survivability in the English Channel in the water, even if they'd escaped a crash, was 20 minutes. So they gathered testimony from American, British eyewitnesses. They held a hearing. It was convened at Anderson's order, who couldn't be there because he was directing bombing missions. It was held by the Chief of Staff, Judge Advocate, and Provost of 8th Air Force. And what this is is a summary table of their findings that was sent to Shafe and the United States Strategic Air Forces in Europe. And you know, you know some of those findings. They were basically that the aircraft went down in the channel. It was probably icy and that Miller was aborted. There were consequences. The commander and senior staff of eight, of I said, service command were aware Miller was traveling with Brazil. They were concerned that they were gonna be investigated and they were. They were derelict in allowing Brazil to authorize his own flight. And they were all fired. Every single one of them eventually lost their, not necessarily immediately, but they were, they were fired. Eighth Air Force ordered the flight dispatch and clearance procedures be changed. No officer could have authorized a trip without a counter signature, no exceptions. Mandatory hourly weather updates, revised non-operational navigational procedures. Now, You've heard that the Lancasters blew the plane out of the sky. Didn't happen. There'll be more about this later, but the British mission that day and the American mission were coordinated. The paperwork matches exactly. RAF was on the same time clock as the AAF. Claims made by authors and people in subsequent years that the RAF was on Greenwich Mean Time are not true. The plane crashed. It was not hit by bomb, jettison. It was a mechanical failure. More about this, which we could get into, which I won't now, I'll go right through it. This, this is the details of what happened with the Lancasters. What, what is important to mention, there was a flight of a ferry flight of small airplanes going over ahead of Miller, Miller's plane. And that's what the Lancasters hit, was that ferry flight. As you know, there are many legends about what happened to them. I'm not going to get into them now. We all know what they are. Bazell was thought of as being a black marketeer, a scoundrel. He wasn't, he was just an officious guy who thought he could clear his own flight and he, he paid for it. Accident forensics, pilot was competent. He, 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 was, it was, he wasn't a problem necessarily. Plane disappeared over the channel. It was identified passing over Beachy Head. But what the pilot did do was put the aircraft, the engine, and the avionics in a position to fail. Remember, most aviation accidents are a confluence of events, not any one of them. A bunch of things have to come together to cause it to happen, and it did here. There was no debris ever found, which argues for a mid-channel event. It happened out in the middle of the channel, nothing ever washed ashore. Engine ice, carburetor, hydraulic fluid leak, pilot disorientation. Basically, the pilot was distracted and lost situational awareness, unfortunately. Finally, Glenn Miller boarded this aircraft and lost his life. He was not authorized to casual travel. He disobeyed explicit orders. But he did it for good reasons. He wanted to get the job done as he saw it. And he was a type A personality, he was Glenn Miller. He did what he did. Nobody was gonna stop him. His state of mind was affected by twin pressures. 
to get facilities completed, and he is worried about his number two man. The United States Air Force and others protected his reputation. There wasn't a conspiracy or cover up, but there was an attempt to protect his reputation. But also, and I mean this very strongly, the negligence, incompetence, and mismanagement of 8th Air Force Service Command was also swept under the rug. They, Glenn Miller never should have been on that aircraft on that day. Never. He was a patriot and a significant musical persona who transcends his era. He has a superior and everlasting musical legacy. He should justly receive a posthumous Legion of Merit. David Niven, John Haynes, other officers he served with received the Legion of Merit from the United States. Glenn deserves that. And he should properly receive the posthumous rank of Brigadier General in the United States Air Force, to which he contributed quite a bit. Now, I know everybody wants to get to the band and get set up for the band, so we should probably get moving, but you, if anybody wants to hang around, I'll answer questions, because I'm gonna go see the band too. But um, the book will be out September 1st, and, you, and we just scratched the surface. Thanks for your time.